Um, you probably have heard that, so we're a great learning community already. Um, you notice we've got it, we've got sign interpreters. Um, my hope is for us to be collaborative. It would be passing strange um, and probably destroy my credibility if all I did was sort of deliver a lecture and not working together. That would be the exact opposite of what I want to do. You could come away and be like, yeah, she's right. Collaboration is good because it was horrible having to listen to her um, talk the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> so, but because we're going to be collaborating, we're going to be going around the room. Um, just like, especially if you're one of the people sitting back there, you know, kind of pop up and raise your hand, and um, so our interpreters um, just know where you are and all of that. Um, okay, so since we are going to be collaborative, um, I want us to introduce ourselves first and talk about um, what we're doing here, what we hope to, um, to achieve. My uh, plan is to be fairly interactive. I have some reasons behind, um, you know, why I think um, teaching students to work collaboratively, learn collaboratively, work collaboratively is important, and what its benefits are, um, what the challenges to that are that I see, and um, some ideas of things that have that I have found have worked for me and yielded the benefits that I was hoping that they would, and some benefits, some other ones as well. Um, so that is my plan. But what my real hope is, though, um, is 100% of the time. People who are teachers um, tend to know more of what they need and are looking for than someone they're talking to. So I hope people will feel really comfortable saying, you know, offering up in your introduction um, what it is you hope to gain. Um, so my introduction myself, I teach in SPA. I came to AU from being a civil rights advocate, working with largely LGBT disability rights and um, access to the civil justice system. So I come out of a non-university environment and more of a public communication environment, but also in much more collaborative workplaces than teaching. Teaching is both the most crowded and the most lonely job in the world, I think. Um, so I come to um, teaching thinking that um, from, from having mostly team projects, um, as most of our students who don't become you know, teachers or solo concert cellists will also, um, will also have. Um, so that's my perspective here. Um, and should we just... Yeah. I'm Jill Rebelstein, and I'm in writing studies. Um, I'm actually returned after a 10-year hiatus where I was uh, writing a book and uh, just uh, had my own writing coaching business where I was teaching all kinds of um, sometimes workshops, and, but most often, most often just uh, individual students. Um, but returning, I see that I have missed a lot. Um, although I've always used collaboration, I um, would love to see how the students have more stake in it. And uh, I was very interested in Hello, my name is Kendra. I'm a student here um, for the, um, in the MFA program. Um, and I wanted to come here today um, for teaching seminars. I'm really fascinated with different topics, different theories, so that's why I'm here today. Hey everyone, my name is Hunter, um, from Department of Health Studies. I'm Ryan right here today. Um, just, just interested in the topic, just getting to much more invested in my courses and interested in working with each other. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Patrick uh, in the um, language department. I'm here because 80%, if not more, of my classes is about student collaboration, especially when it is language and not linguistics. So as much as I gain, and as you said, sometimes it's as issues. So sometimes they can group projects. Yeah. Hi, I'm Erin Moran. I'm an instructional designer here in the CTRL, so I'm very interested in learning more about collaborative learning environments. I'm Vita Zilab in the sociology department, and I was uh, planning a new course, and I wanted to increase some of the collaborative aspects in that course. My name, is, my name is Barbara Bernstein, and I teach an activity course in the adjunct in the health studies department. I teach salsa dancing, and I have found because I have a block course, and I have to really make a number of different sequence, sequential things that we do, so people don't get tired of doing the same thing for two and a half hours. I found it very successful to have them give students a challenge and have them work on the challenge in groups, which is a form of collaborative And I'm looking for other tips on how to make it better or extend the ways that I come up with. 
Well, I'm Anna Olsen, uh, I'm Associate Director of Programs at Adam, so I have to here at CTRL, um, but I'm also an adjunct in Charity Politics, so that's the main reason I'm here today, because I want to do a bit more collaboration in my class. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keo Kim. I'm the executive director of CTRL, but I also uh, am a faculty in the Department of Environmental Science, where I teach the Capstones class, where it's a collaborative kind of a course, and so I'm always uh, interested in different tips and ideas. Okay, my name is okay. <laughs> my name is Ben Gandon. I'm teaching in the economics department, and uh, I am teaching a course among others which is called Dogma Theory, which is a habit of mind, ethical reasoning class. And in that class, I'm using quite a bit of uh, student group discussions and stuff like that. So I don't have any specific. I want to know what, like the topic of it. I'm Arthur Stallward from a first year instructor and advisor here. Um, our course, Core 100 to Core 200, the majority of the points and grading is based off of participation. Um, so, figuring out different ways that get the students collaborate with each other and be able to, to get themselves invested in the discussions and dialogues that we're having. So, you might be able to get some some assistance as well. My name is Sonia Walti. I'm in the School of Public Affairs. And um, and here, uh, because I use a lot of team collaboration in uh, graduate work, and uh, we'd like to learn more about the assessing student collaboration in particular. And I am Sarah Miller. I'm in the biology department. And uh, we, I, work, I teach a lot of labs as well as lecture classes. So, labs, we do a mixture of individual work. Work. And um, I think it's really important that we do a lot of group work, but it sometimes doesn't go as smoothly as, as we'd like. And um, I'd also be interested in, in how we assess um, group work or and collaboration between group efforts and, and um, just hear other people's views on that. Scott Cowan, teach in the School of Communication. Here, because on my syllabus, it says there's three-way learning. Learn from the prof, I learn from the students, and then peer-to-peer. -peer. And I want to get, I want to get to the point where it's not just in the syllabus and it's not just me saying it, that a student actually says, I learned from that student, that they actually are conscious of the learning from someone else. And then the other part is, I'm less concerned about assessing group work. I'm more concerned that we're assigning group work and not teaching students how to work in groups. It's like Lord of the Flies. I've been working in a group, and, and we're not teaching them anything about the pedagogy and mechanics of working in groups. So I'm more assessing is important, but I'm more, I want them to actually learn how to work in groups and not just tell them to work in a group. Great. Um, so there's a lot there, um, and I think that's a good segue. So my favorite um, teaching experience that I've yet had um, was in, I teach a course, the American Constitution, that includes a moot court um, project, so you argue a legal case before, um, before a panel of attorneys, actually. And um, I assign, I had, for the, I've done this, this is like my 14th time teaching this class. For those of you who are old enough to recognize this, I call the class Freebird, like the song, because it's like, everybody wants an encore, I gotta come out and do it. And I used to assign people to work with a partner, um, in this class to prepare for moot court, and I would say, you know, part of what you have to do um, for the assignment part is going to be on a grade you on the feedback um, that you give um, that partner. That how useful is it? You're going to be actually learning a little bit about being a teacher here. And over the years, that's developed more and more. And last semester, I actually moved it to instead of just a partner, they actually work in four or five person law firms. And what happened before final moot court, they have two moot courts a year, I came in and usually it's like this sort of hellscape of uh, panic before moot court. And I told the class, okay, it's you know last day before moot court, what do you need to know from me? Or would you just like to work in your firms during the class period? And everyone's like, we want to go to our firms. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm the best teacher in the world. I'm not just like, holy fuck. Um, yeah. <laughs> because they don't need me anymore. Um, this is great. And so um, I realized how wonderful this was. And then um, to Scott's point, on the last day, I asked, uh, I always do in this class, because I've been trying to improve it every semester, just make it better 
um, means a lot to me and the students. And I asked them what they thought, you know, high points, slow points, just things for the future. And it became this giant discussion about what they thought of their peers and how amazing it was to see, you know, and how much you know, this person learned from this, these two people who always made her sort of lift her game and how much, and um, a lot of their feedback that they gave me about the class is how much they admired uh, the people that they worked with. And I just thought, you know, this is, this is the goal, like this is living the dream. Um, so that's what I'm hoping. I mean, I think that's a very bright eyed, sort of optimistic view of collaborative learning. Um, but I think, uh, I think for me it is the goal, and I've realized there are a lot of reasons that there's a great benefit, not just to make me feel good so that the last day before my report I get to sit down and watch them work, but um, because it has benefits. Um, so, um, obviously fostering classroom conversation is important. We want our students to learn from each other somewhat, hopefully. Uh, we want them to be able to engage back and forth with ideas in real time. I think ping pong with a professor, you know, I, <laughs> it's, uh, you know you're, on, you're the playing tennis of one person against 30, doesn't work. It really needs, and we want to foster that um, conversation and um, getting them working together tends to make them better at seeing each other as part of the learning process. Um, uh, group work, I find if, it's, if you can assign it right and assess it right, um, it improves their professionalism, um, being responsible to one another, figuring out how to manage their time by finding, and I know probably a lot of you, what you're hearing, the challenge from your students, I'm guessing is don't assign it to a group we can never find times to meet. Um, but that's part of life and part of what they're going to do beyond here. Um, it helps them with problem solving. Um, I find, and for those of you who what you're really looking for is class participation, um, I find that this supports universal design. Um, class participation, meaning equal accessibility regardless of disability, language background, personality, neurotypicality, um, dialect, um, I find that class participation can be a really fraught thing to grade, um, particularly if they don't know what it is. Conversely, though, if you're thinking about participation, I always feel like maybe I should rename it for future syllabi contribution. You can make it much more broad and create more opportunities um, uh, for people to play to the strengths that they have and not measure it by, did you check all the boxes, I wrote something, I said something out loud, I answered a question, but did you truly contribute something into the space? You think about any um, group project you've ever worked on, um, the chances were that people actually had varied tasks that they contributed, and someone was really good at working Blackboard and Canvas, and someone was a great researcher, and someone is a fast writer, etc. Um, the idea that everybody did the identical job and we have five people with the same job description in a group isn't usually what we do. Um, so I think playing to people's own um, uh, strengths. I've noticed since I started assigning group work that it's actually deepened students engagement with the material and understanding of it. With the Moot Court project, um, they end up reading more cases and learning more deeply. With the other projects, which for me in SPA have been designing a legislative proposal or a political campaign, they go much more broadly because several of them are researching separately, but then they bring their things together and learn and engage with them, and they end up having read you know, four or five times as much as they might have to, to research an individual paper. Um, does cultivate respect uh, for their peers when they are assessed by their peers. Um, one thing that I think is really important when we talk about assessment, and I'll get to that, is that I think we actually need to have them assessing each other a bit. And I know that that can sound fraught. I'm not a competitive person. I actually went to a hippie college where you can take all of your classes pass fail, and the competitive atmosphere that sort of persists amongst our students is really alien to me. Personally, the way that they, you know, treat this as a competition, I find when they're truly being given a metric for evaluating one another's work and knowing that they'll be on the receiving end of that, um, there comes more fairness. Um, they're looking at each other through objective standards, 
and they're also looking at each other with the understanding that, that it's happening back, that they'll be measured by that standard too. And what I find is that they end up being more respectful of and um, admiring of each other. Um, and it develops a trust necessary for tough conversations. I run the project on civil discourse, which I founded this year, um, that's uh, <laughs> supposed to you know, make a American you better than America at um, having challenging conversations across ideology or identity. And I think that that is a very, very heavy lift for people who don't actually quite know one another or really have any sense of one another's um, goodwill or effort to start with, so should we build the wall? Or, you know, uh, great. Um, actually, don't even end there, just put um, Anyway. So those are the benefits. Um, the challenges are going to be really familiar to you, I think. Um, nothing about their experience before they get here prepares them to be assessed as a group. Um, some team athletes do. But it doesn't seem like there's a whole much of an ethos of that. Um, many of them have come from a school where maybe they were the shining star, and so they regard um, um, regard. Uh, you know, peers as someone who possibly drags them down. Um, some of them have imposter syndrome, on the other hand, where they, they I've had students in my classes who are convinced that all of their classmates are, are um, experts, and I'm um, like, do not confuse confidence for accomplishment. You know, opinions aren't accomplishments, I assure you, you are all equally um, ignorant. Um, and then others who have an expert syndrome. This is my new blog I made. It says student tears <laughs> made by the Socratic method. Um, I actually have this as a PNG. Yeah, I can send it to you to print out. Um, anyway, um, technology is a challenge. Interpersonal communication. Um, we do have. Um, I know, if you follow current events, you might have noticed we're not living in a very civil society right now. Just I can send readings on that. Like. Um, okay, so those are the challenges, but I actually really think they're surmountable. Um, so I want to start with um, um, class participation. Um, so class participation can be fraught. I mean, you were saying that overwhelmingly it's an AUX or AUX2. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly, there's a lot of class participation, but what does it mean? And typically, what they understand from high school, and I think what I understood when I started teaching was, well, did you raise your hand and say stuff? Mm -hmm. um, and I think both with the, we almost never want to give very, very low grades, slash, we know in our hearts that the fact that someone might be shy, you know, but then we've met her in office hours, you know, she has a lot to say. We don't really want to mark low class participation for, you know, so, so it becomes hard to assess so I um, design it more universally. I tell my students up at the beginning of the semester what, uh, class, what participation can consist of. I teach Socratically, so everybody gets cold called some, and they have to be prepared. Um, I include Blackboard, using Blackboard conversations where you can add comments to class discussion on Blackboard as part of your participation grade. Another Blackboard discussion on every course where you can add an interesting reading um, that you label. Um, I include um, self-assessing um, uh, how they do in small group turning talks. Um, I include uh, have you helped someone else um, with their work outside of class or had more conversations outside of class. Um, coming to my office hours counts. Um, you can design in a bunch of ways of engaging that are more universal. And the last one is listening. I ask students, um, listening slash building a personal goal, I ask them to come up with a goal that's related to their engagement in the learning community and set a goal and set some way they could show themselves and need that they, um, that they uh, met it. And with participation, for many of them it's listening. To some of them it's accepting criticism, um, engaging with an idea, um, that they disagree with, or here dealing with ideas that they disagree with. Um, and what we'll do for those, and for some of them, it's speaking up. For the speaking up group, I arrange with them in advance, like I'm going to tell you, you know, I'm going to cold call you about this case or this question next Tuesday. Just be there for it, and we're going to increase your engagement for the listening people. Um, it's moving their comments to the end of the class and engaging directly with another student's comment. 
Um, and then at the end, I have a Blackboard self-assessment that I can uh, that I'll show you on a slide um, that rate where they actually assign themselves um, a class participation grade. Um, is this big enough? It's not. I'll, I'll make sure that this. Um, I'll make sure that this. Um, uh, that all of these slides are available for everybody um, to look at. I ultimately give them their final grade, uh, but they tend to be pretty accurate. Uh, some people will call them shorthand women um, <laughs> undergrade themselves. Like they'll they'll demonstrate, and I'll agree with them that they got a bunch of these outside things done, like being prepared, arguing both sides talking to a classmate about the material, and then said, but I really didn't raise my hand as much as, you know, great participators do, so I get, you know, a B minus, and you're like, okay, so they might not have internalized the values, but they, they've done the thing. Um, I find that having it be clear this way does tend to, um, does tend, and this is a Blackboard rubric quiz, um, that includes some other things, including tell me, tell me, you know, how many unexcused absences you had, tell me how often roughly you did the reading and subject to the academic integrity code. So we sort of work together to assess their relationship to the learning community. And I queue up, I, I utilize, I, I check in a few times during the semester, how do people feel they're getting with their listening, how do people feel like they're progressing with their goal of engaging more, listening more, raising their hand more. Um, are people having conversations outside of class, etc. Um, remember to use the Blackboard thing, send your, send your classmates the cool article on, on point. Um, and those things, well, and remember if I didn't call on you or you were nervous about something, you can always put the comment on Blackboard that you're going to make in class um, later. So I find that this is a universal design tool for me. Um, people know what class participation consists of, and it does consist of things that you don't have to be an outgoing, confident, um, neurotypical English speaker with, um, with political views consistent with the AU community in, in order to shine um, in this. Um, so it feels fair to me, but it's also something that I feel that I can quantify. Um, and something that they at least feel they can shoot for that's something other than, well, I'm a shy person, so that's going to be my low mark. But it's not going to be that low because my teacher's nice and knows there's something weird about assessing people for being shy. <laughs> um, so, um, any questions about the class participation? Um, Joyce? Yeah. Would you mind sharing the presentation later after? Yeah, I will um, send the slides, I guess, to um, Essensbury. Is that what you were sharing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, definitely well. Um, and I am, um, these are just screen grabs of the Blackboard thing, but um, I guess Aaron, you would no, be the person who would know. Mm -hmm. If it isn't really comfortable with doing like Blackboard quizzes and assessments, if they really help everything, everything that I'm going to show you, like using Blackboard assessment tools makes it way, way easier. Mm -hmm. um, so just going to put that out there. Um, I um, tend to find that. Um, as I've looked at, um, excuse me, as I've looked at um, civil discourse, I've looked at the challenges and the successes that people have in having tough conversations, um, often in you know across ideology or identity. But I think some conversations are tough because they're awkward, like group work where you don't know people or you're not sure what's expected of you. Um, I find that the real difference between unsuccessful or pointless and with point is purpose. Um, if you think about, from my perspective, if you look at how ridiculous it is to read the comments on Twitter or you know any internet format, a lot of what's so worthless about it is nobody has a shared goal. It's not like people are trying to solve a problem. I imagine if there's like a cooking Twitter where people are going, how do you make pie crust not stick to things or something, maybe those comments are useful. But it's usually like deciding together as an internet whether, you know, Joe61739 is an idiot, um, you know, doesn't go very far. And so I find that with small group conversations, which I do think are important to the universal design component, there are some people who will speak up a bit more in a group of four than you know, a large group, and I'm sure you've seen that too, um, that I have them do a problem-solving issue that where they're going to be accountable to come back to the large group and report back. 
um, rather than just a question like, hey, why don't you guys engage with this particular reading? So I like doing a lot of factual hypotheticals or I put them in the role of advisors to a body. You're advising AU or you're advising the city council of Springfield, West Dakota. They're deciding between two things. You know, tell them how my information literacy exercise that I do the first day of one of my classes. I, um, I have them design um, uh, uh, the best way to figure to rate the top jumbo slice in Adams Morgan, and um, you know which sources they should be using, and report back. And then with that small group work, I think a really big part of of the challenges of group work. And I know you said that assessment wasn't that of interest to everyone, but I actually think assessment is really important because that which we're not assessing. Um, partly there can be an element of fairness. Um, if I'm not telling you what I'm grading you on, um, the chance that it'll feel subjective and a group work will feel subjective. Um, but I think accountability is how we get people to try stuff. Um, so in order for accountability, we're going to turn and talk small group stuff. What I do is they know this, that I'm going to flip to the Socratic method um, after we come back to the large group. So I just might. You know, I just might say, um, you know, Sonia's group, what did you come up with? And so everybody who turns and talks, like, actually is going to have to come back and give a product. And then a way that I make that meta um, collaborative um, is that um, oftentimes after there's a turn and talk small group, what I'll do is I'll have everybody put their solution in some way out into the space and get them all up onto the board. Um, and then um, put all of the options of, you know, for solutions onto a Blackboard discussion and say one of the things that you're going to do for your next reflection or as an assignment for the next class is comment on one of the solutions and tell me like um, what, what, uh, what you think of it. Um, one thing that I really like to do with that exercise is how people write a reflection um, explaining why one of the suggestions that one of the groups came up with is actually better than theirs. Um, and I found that that has been, um, it does foster respect. It also really makes people listen and engage while they're hearing um, what's being offered. Um, and you'll hear great stuff. And one thing that becomes really interesting is that often different students have, have a different sense of what is a good solution. And it'll help me as a teacher learn a little bit more about my audience. What do they value? What's persuasive to them? Um, but as well, give the students, I think, themselves a sense of, you know, someone saw merit in what I had. Um, and I will say just as far as that, with the collaborative um, thing, I, a ground rule in my class is I will not call on you if your hand is up while I'm speaking, and I will not call on you if your hand is up while another student is speaking. Um, just as a collaborative um, learning matter, why would I have that rule? I'm just wondering, when do you call them? When do I call them? You just call them. You don't want them to raise their hand. No, I want people to. I want people to raise their hand, but I'll say like, if I'm if I've got a question going, if I if I'm gonna make, I, it's so a very the prompt is your question. question. The prompt is my question, but especially if somebody else is, um, I ask a ton of questions. But if somebody is talking, like, if you're talking, mm -hmm. um, and I'm like this, like, <laughs> or, you know, you're like this, um, nobody, um, I'm never going to call on that person that's, like, got her hand up while you're talking, you as a classmate. Why wouldn't I? Because it's, it's like the, the person cannot wait until the person is finished with talking. And so it's not difficult to listen. Yeah, I mean, if, if she's if she's got her hand up while she's still talking, there's no possibility that she's we're hearing all of what you're saying. So I find that interesting because <laughs> maybe the students so smart they've sussed and assessed whatever it is they're saying, like you're doing right now. And my challenge with I get critiqued a lot, interrupt students. I try to explain. I don't know how long you're going to speak. We have an hour and 15 minutes in those classes. <laughs> And I don't know where everyone's going, including it might be wrong, and then I have to spend time to recorrect. I'm really glad you said that, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> because I, I do sometimes interrupt my students, because another of one of my ground rules is, if your answer isn't responsive to the thing that happened before, that's on the floor with the other student, or isn't responsive to the top, either my question or the topic that we're doing, 
And a question, can you, can you help me understand, actually, is responsive. I don't really get what you're getting at, is responsive. But if I say, you know, why did you wear a blazer and a jacket? And you're like, you know, in Mesopotamia, um, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so I'm going to go, hang on, stop. Um, did they do that? Did they do that? <laughs> anyway. um, so, no, but this is so challenging because I don't have the patience to wait. And why should we take up all the other classrooms? I, I'm trying to judge when to jump in. Well, but the thing is, is like, uh, so we're not them. I mean, right? Uh, we're not them. And, and I don't think there's anything hypocritical in saying we're all having respect and we're all listening to each other, but the chief, chief executive in, of relevance and, and, um, and value will, will uh, moderate, you know, what is relevant, what's adding value. And so if something isn't responsive or if it's over long, now I will stop someone. So what I hear you saying is there are real limitations, Professor Schwartz, on, you know, on, on the utility of this. Or what I hear you saying is this is a great ground rule for students, but it wouldn't be a ground rule we'd, we'd honor ourselves because it, it could let our students, you know, who become Lord of the Flies and, you know, there's no grown-ups on the island. And there has to be a grown-up on the island, absolutely. But what I'm trying to get them to do is hear that you're supposed to be learning from each other, and I'll moderate whether Sparky is just, you know, reciting um, his laundry list, and we don't need that. We're going to do something um, more relevant, but you know, so yeah. <laughs> but we're not students, right? While you were doing, I just like must respond to whatever you need. So. The student, the group, was making a presentation, and one girl raised her hand, and obviously no one stopped, and no one answered, because I wasn't there. I uh -huh. was just sitting there as a student and just listening. But in the end, it turned out she had a question about a word, which was actually important to know, to understand what they were talking about. So now I'm thinking, no one stopped, no one answered her question. Yeah. She probably missed that piece of information well, oh, yeah, she asked, asked, asked okay. it later, they answered it, everything was fine, but... Well, I think it's all in balance, right? I mean, one thing is, is your presentation and, and what you're asking the students to draw, draw up has to be accessible, and it has to be in digestible chunks. The thing I'll say about that interaction, and I wasn't there, is one thing that comes to mind is, some, you know, their presentation might have been very good, and stopping in the middle to answer one word for one student might have detracted from their ability for their whole okay. to demonstrate their work. So it's a balance. Now for us as teachers, we're supposed to be making it as accessible as we can um, across language, across knowledge. And I think there's a there's a flaw in what you're delivering mm -hmm. if there isn't that give and take, or what we're delivering if there isn't that give and take. But there's going to be a line, and at times, one, one exercise I've had my students do, and I've tried it myself is I've had them sit down and listen to each other for three minutes like you cannot interrupt um, listen to this person listen to that person I'll actually I don't have this on a slide but I'll put it um, I'll put it on something and, and send it to essence like the things that I send and see what it felt like to listen for three minutes and then see what it felt like to be listened to for three minutes and then we share back and then there's a little like script. It's like, okay, the next thing you can do is ask for clarification after mm -hmm. you've listened for three minutes. And the next thing after that is to mirror back and make sure like you sort of recite to them, this is what I understood you to say, and get clarification and then swap. And uniformly, what I find every time I've done this with a class is that students say it felt really weird not to be able to sort of jump in and interrupt. But uniformly, they say it felt really great to be listened to for three minutes. <laughs> and they also uniformly say that it ended up, when I always ask this question, was there something you wanted to jump in and contradict or ask that it ended up they said within you know, 30 seconds later? And it's always yes. Yeah. So I think, I think there is an extent to which developing that skill in them of like, you know, if your hand hadn't been up, what is Mesopotamia? Where is it? Where was it? Does it still exist? I don't know. Whatever. Um, if your hand hadn't been up all over that one word, you might have really been engaging with the rest of the material and gotten it. Um, I, I think developing those listening skills can be good, but of, co of course, none of these, none of these things that I'm saying is, is an absolute. But what I want them to do 
is break out of, especially the don't raise your hand while someone else is, you know, while a peer is talking. I want them to understand that they're accountable to reacting to what that person said, really listening to understand. We're not, um, you know, uh, sorry, we're not, I, I had a little thing I did. I don't want us to be spokes on a wheel where the professor is in the center and the spokes go out. It should be a web. Um, so getting less signals to themselves um, to each other is important. Um, one thing I do is I assess, um, I give an opportunity for them to peer critique and edit one another's work, but make it an assessed component. Um, that can be fraught if you only do an exam that has, you know, it's a closed book exam or a finite timed exam. Um, I do have a lot of um, assessments that, that make that possible, and in particular, if I have an assessment that's a project where you have a choice of like five questions, I'll say if you want to do peer critique, you can actually earn credit for it, and what you'll do is tell me which topic you're doing, and I will assign you a partner who I think has complementary skills to yours who's doing another mm -hmm. um, topic, so there's no academic integrity. Um, question and then also I think I can send this to Essence, but I have a peer critiquing guidelines document that's like here's what you should do when reading someone else's paper. Here's the kind of feedback that you should be sure to um, to do, including like did the person really answer the question and fulfill the assignment? And is there a piece of and stuff? Yes, Mr. Cowan. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, for my real question, is that appropriate in your schema to raise the hand then there? <laughs> no, right. I'm sorry? What was it? If I was in your class, would that have been inappropriate or appropriate when I raised my hand? I don't know what It seems like you asked the questions. So, I guess one challenge is, is and I think this is really um, something that's hard about, because I really feel like I'm sort of vomiting forth a bunch of techniques, is that um, my classes don't work like this, like, like this here. Um, my classes really, I also, and I think this is one thing around class participation, all of my syllabi on the day, so it says like, you know, for Wednesday the 18th, read this and that and the other, it says class participation prep, and it says prepare to answer questions about this and that, or prepare to uh, deal with the issue and this and that. Before class. Kind of, yeah, I guess you could call it pre prep. Um, the question of pure stuff. Do you have, I do it in class, peer, they peer review each other's work. Do you have them do it after class? Um, outside of class. Outside. And I'll get to you actually the collaborative group, the assessed group projects, because um, I think that'll hopefully be helpful. Um, okay. <clears throat> the pre prompt, is that, did you say that was on Blackboard or Sentence Pen? So my syllabi all have, and I, I tend to fill this part in my syllabi are Google Docs so that I can update them. I do a lot of current events -y stuff, and so I, instead of being like, hey, um, American Constitution, read this new thing that came out about this new Supreme Court case, if I email, they don't read email, all my syllabi are Google Docs so I can update things, and that way as class is going on and I'm feeling where people are, um, I will often amend the class participation prep thing, but I never, I never edit anything on the syllabus more, like fewer than a class in advance. So if it's a Tuesday, Friday class, like nothing's going to show up on the syllabus after Tuesday that you would have to know Friday. Um, but I'll put, you know, class participation prep, you know, continued question about, um, you know, how how much intent is you're required to prove in a discrimination case, and you know, blah blah. Um, so I think, but so my classes are so interactive, they tend to be quick ping pong, Socratic method, and kind of offering forth a lecture like with slides is something I almost never do. So I think the dynamic in this space is so it's not only to me not lecture, you won't even lecture with slides. I very seldom with slides. But you're using it today. Yes, because I want to show you pretty things <laughs> that I can't describe. <laughs> Um, so would this be unfair, just hypothetically? How would you organize us to do group work? How would I organize you to do group work? As one example of something. I'm so glad you asked. Um, so I have a few formats of group work, um, and what I've found over time is that having people organize themselves by friend group isn't a great um, choice. Um, what I'd rather have them do is organize themselves by interest. If they're doing a sign-up, opt-in thing, and I ask them, please, you know, 
there's not a chance that you and everybody else and pi theta cosine are all interested in you know court secrecy like as your number one thing. Um, we just got that. That's my that's my grad. That's good stuff, right? Okay. Um, you know, so be honest. So I'll, there are times when I'll do a group project. I'll say I have these sort of six topics because I need six groups. Um, sign up on a Google Doc. I love Google Docs for your topic, and that becomes your group. Another thing, that's what I do in my classes where there's something like a legislative proposal. Um, for, the, for the times when I assign people, so these law firms that I assigned for my moot court, I assign them once I'm at least a month in the class, so I just did it. And I actually assign it based on really looking at class participation and personalities and how people wrote and how far along they are in comprehension and creating a balanced group with complementary skills and people. And I also, in those ways as well, you know, you know they're, I don't know if this has ever happened to you that you've gotten around a strong personality in one of the classes. <laughs> so like I, I don't, you know, I try and put somebody who can handle the, strong personalities. So there's two ways. There's me doing it based on I think this group of people can learn from each other in a very specific way, and there's opt-in um, by their interest in a topic. Um, yeah, if so you have too few people uh, sign up for one, you know, if there's two people in one group or one person and everyone else signs up for another group, do you have a fail safe for that? It, just... it becomes a great reason to uh, be one of the first people to sign up because um, I have as many slot, you know, I put, you know, slot one through five on, you know, court secrecy and on voter ID and, you know, whatever the topics <laughs> are. Um, so I have them use a Blackboard quiz as part of, as you know, I, my, I always have assignments um, done on Blackboard and I have a hybrid, you know, assignment with a quiz. So they're appending whatever the written work product is, if there's something like that. And describing their collaborative work, um, how often did you meet, how did you help them, how did they help you. This one's for a new court um, when I was doing it as partners, not law firms. Describe their progress. Um, describe actually how they did on their on on the presentation that they did. Um, I both use that as a metric. Did these people really collaborate? Um, but as well, um, one of the things on this particular work includes offering advice, teacherly sort of professorial type advice, um, to the classmate for what they could do better next time, and that is a graded component. And I talk to them about what. What I want, what I want is something useful, and what I want is something that demonstrates engagement both with their understanding of what this person did and needs to do going forward, but also dem demonstrates engagement with the material. So good feedback on a peer's new court would not only be like, hey, you should stand up straighter and be more confident in yourself next time. It would show that they understood the legal questions so well that they could say, you know, this is this is the part of your argument that had strength, this is the part of your argument that the judges didn't buy and, and, and a way that you could do um, more going forward. Um, so for me, that's assessing the collaboration, but it's also a way of assessing sort of a greater depth of their engagement with the material. Did they see, like the students see their grades, or the grades, the comments? They don't see one another's grades. Um, I do tell them they're submitting a blackboard. You know what should Sparky do better? They're supposed what should Sparky do for next time? I tell them what you have to do is take that piece, paste mm -hmm. it into an email, and literally give it to Sparky okay. so Sparky does it next time. Mm -hmm. um, for the group projects, I'm very very transparent about this at the beginning of the semester during ad drop period that there is a group project and that they are going to be graded on their collaboration in the group project and they're going to be graded on the quality of their participation as a colleague. I'm also, as a hard-ass American, um, I'm very explicit with them that not doing well on the collaboration component and, and not being fair and real, not like some strange vendetta by someone means that I'm not going to ever write the correct letter. Um, the correct letters are dependent on the colleague qualities. They're not actually dependent on you know, RNA or being, but this is where it all is for me, um, which resonates with them because I'm, I'm not you know, a scholar type person. I just had a bunch of cool jobs in DC and people like taking my classes so they can meet the people I've worked with. So for them, that, <laughs> that sort of resonates. Um, 
But um, so I asked them, um, you know, about, uh, and I, you know, it says in the beginning, it was the academic integrity code about how often they met. Um, were there contributions? Did, sh did they volunteer for everything and complete it on time? And then I asked them, would, would your group members work with you again? <laughs> wow. Um, probably want me to work with them, you know, um, and explain. And then, um, you know, would you want to work with your group again? Um, there have been, I also ask people if someone's sort of dropping the ball, please come to me and tell me because if, if, if it's interfering with your capacity to complete what you need to complete and be assessed on, we can, we can deal with that. Um, um, and um, can I just ask you, how do you deal with that? So when that happens, I do find the person, I say, this is going on with the group. Um, and I tell them it's, you know, it's the best thing you can do. When one person has dropped the ball, that what I have is, and so I, I, I do um, read the right hand to that student, I find it. There are times when that's happening because someone's got a very serious thing happening. Um, I've had students who, you know, have a parent dying or just horrendous, just a story. I mean, we've all right heard the, the things that happened in our student. I had a student who was a dying parent whose grandmother couldn't come care for his dying parent because of a Muslim ban. You know, it was like, was on TV, it would feel like, ah, oh, that's too unrealistic. <laughs> um, so you can help and support and offer adjustments. Um, but then my grading rubric, I love Blackboard grading rubrics, they're hard to make, but then they really help, um, is um, everybody in the group is, this is just one example of one, is getting the same, um, these, these three things, organization, presentation, support, solution, this is a legislative proposal, so it's sort of um, in higher thinking, but the colleague rating is part of the group project score. And what can happen then is, you know, every, all of Sparky's three long-suffering colleagues earned an A on that um, thing, and, um, you know, Sparky got a low colleague rating. Um, and, um, and that's how the rating can be some individual. Um, as well, I don't have this a slide for this, but in group work presentations, what I also do is I have every, I don't have presentations. Um, it's really hard, I think, for students to listen to each, to like 10 presentations in class. And I also think it makes the presentations like too short to be that useful, and I like a lot of Q&A. So this is very time consuming, but what I do with group um, work is that I set up a bunch of times also on a Google Doc to sign up to do presentations, some in the class period, some out, and people just have to work out when they can do it. And instead of listening to all 10 group projects, what I say is every student has to do their presentation, and every student has to be a judge for at least for one presentation. And I have a rubric for their assessment too, and ranking and rating and feedback. Um, and, and so the presentations that students end up doing, it's like 10 minutes of presentation, but like 20 minutes of Q&A, mostly with the students asking them the tough questions, which I think could get a little bit to the challenge you had with your group. I think knowing potentially that a third of the time was going to be spent on the outward mm -hmm. and the rest of it was going to be spent on back and forth might have, might have made it easier for that student to sit tight. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's how I do it, but that's how I manage to create accountability. I'm just really transparent at the beginning of the semester, like, you have to be ready to do this colleague piece of things. Um, and I, I have very few people thoroughly and truly drop the ball, and when they do, we address it. But most of the time, what I end up finding out is the feedback is really great from student to student, um, what they think of their group. Um, and I've even had students in law firm stay friends, which I think is people really know. Um, so those are my basic, uh, every, oh, also you should always have like at least three Mean Girl GIFs in every slideshow. <laughs> which I think that's why I don't do slides, because how many Mean Girl GIFs are there? <laughs> the answer is infinite, yeah. um, actually. <laughs> Um, so those are sort of my outward-facing things that I have to share, but I was hoping that the rest of the time could really be um, so yeah. I took a lot of notes. I think stuff that 
I never you know, to think about just a peer review outside of class. Now I'm wondering why I never thought about that. Why am I trying to squeeze the peer review into 10 minutes in class only? Right. Well, and it, I, I think, um, oh, and another thing I, I put it on the slides, but not in here. I give an option for, so my assessments, I like my assessments to be fairly universally designed. So every, for most of the time, other than the class that I was moving forward, I give people an option between, you know, various types of things, a paper, an actual one-to-one -one presentation with me where someone talks for like seven minutes with slides and then, and then I question them for 20, which a lot of students really like. It's very time consuming, but it's great. Um, but um, but I generally I'm getting a little braver at saying students can actually for one of their projects that I'll have one option where they can work in a group and I'll let, I'll say if you want to make a video with a group of two or three people as your answer you can and not that many people do it um, but it's interesting to see students opting into working together for a final project that's like 35 percent of their grade that they could have done alone. And there they would just select each other, so it could be your brother and Pi Theta cosine. Yeah. Any stuff? Can you elaborate a little more how you enter that uh, co um, colleague assessment in your rubric? Um, is that based off of you asking each team about the other team members? Or how so does that last? I wonder if I just pull up. Mine get populated there. If I pull up Blackboard. Um, so what I end up doing is, um, see my friend's cat pictures. Um, what I end up doing is, while you're answering that one, at the same time, they're assessing themselves and then they assess the group, each group member. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so, and I don't ask them to give a numerical, I'm just, um, I don't ask them to give a numerical score to their colleague. Um, um, so, um, um, when I met the group I attended, um, my contributions, my, my groups, uh, and these are all worth zero points, but you know, I do a subjective, um, it, you know, essay explain why your group would or would not want you back again, uh, would you want to work with your group again, explain, um, this is just uh, uh, explain more about your project, and this is a space that I go to do where sometimes in a group project, um, and I tell them this in advance, it could be, you know, Matthew will say, you know, Sophia and Penelope and Lucy all wanted to do this thing and I really had this idea that this other way would work better. Ultimately, we went with their approach, but I would have done this other thing and here's why. Um, and if that's something he wants to say, you know, great, fine. Um, it doesn't always happen, sometimes it does, or they'll bring out a dynamic. And then um, the rubric, is associated with this last 20 point essay and the, um, the rubric that you saw then I'm plugging in. Um, ultimately the colleague rating ends up being, I don't want to say subjective based on that, but um, you know, um, and I also incorporate so, so it is, but it is subjective based on the self-assessment of well, what I do is, and this is also time consuming, I don't know a way to do it otherwise, so if there's five people in the group, I'll just actually open up and read all five of their narratives about this stuff first, get a sense of, were there any problems, is everybody on the same page, did they all work well together, and then I'll actually go back in and assign the colleague rating. So it takes, it, it does take extra time, but I, I feel it's, it, well, it becomes more fair. The reason I'm asking is, I use Catney. Catney Donald, um, it's called? just it's Catney, C-A-T-M-E, Donald work. It's expensive, it used to be free. Uh, it does exactly that, and it matches up the different team members, and it then scores things like outliers, etc., on flats and kinds of other things based on questions like that. It does this for you, and it does it marvelously. It's, it's, it's hard with Blackboard, but it, I mean, it's possible. No, Catney is like, bam, it's so easy. And there's a self-assessment, and there's a peer assessment. 
So it does it like in a matrix form. All you have to do is import the, the, the students with a CVS file, and it's all in there. You know, and they you could choose the rubrics, etc. They have tools. It's wonderful, except it's now paid. So I'm kind of looking for how to I mean, this would not cross-reference for you. I imagine Blackboard might have a feature like this. I don't find this is too super time-consuming. Well, I'm in peer and self-assessment in Blackboard, and it's blank. And anybody here use a peer? No, 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 no. I, I just yeah. use, I have my, you know, I, I've been using this format, and the only flaw in it for me doing it has been that I, I do have to, you know, read the whole group stuff before I then go in and enter the numbers. Um, so I tend to have, you know, on another screen, I'm like, okay, I know group four is going to have, you know, what their, you know, um, what their marks are going to be for, why is that going? Um, you know, for these other things. Um, and I'll just check, I'll just cross check them to come up with the colleague stuff. Usually it ends up being uniform because overwhelmingly, if you have had people working together and you have queued up, you know, this is what I mean by group work, and you're going to be assessed on it, and really a part of this is, is do people want to work with you again? I've overwhelmingly had groups say, I really want to stop working for my group. Um, because they know, I tell them in advance, if, if Sparky's like the worst person and is smoking crack all semester, it's not. You know, it's going to hurt Sparky. I'm not going to let that ruin your semester and your grade. You know, it's not going to be unfair. My question is, do you ever take points away from students who receive um, sort of negative you know, critiques from the peers? Because that's what I'm trying to figure out now. Wow. The next time if I do group work, like what is the percentage I should um, sort of punish the students? You have to, get, and that's why I'm clear, you know, transparent and clear about it up front. And I'm also very transparent that it doesn't mean equality in the sense of everybody researches one question, every, you know, find out what's fair among you in your planning. If one person is really good at creating a website that's going to go for your fictitious Nonprofit advocacy group, and one person's really good at, you know, speaking. Like you don't have to speak five in a row for equal time. Like whatever it is, um, that's your strength. Is if you if you equate it to fairness amongst yourselves and relate act, relate it to me as fairness, that's fine. Um, but yeah, but what I think is good again about Blackboard rubrics is there's this is just a screen grab. But you know you you can when you click when you choose you know. Whichever one you do, there's space to put the feedback in there. And there's also space, space to put feedback kind of at the end of the rubric. And I will write, you know, Sparky. Okay, so the, the last one that says colleague grading, so the points are the point that they received? So I don't have the colleagues say, you know, well, I would give Sophia an A and Sparky a C. I have them write very, it's you know, in that self narrative. Self in that narrative, you know. I showed up this amount, I was on time, I did my stuff, um, this is why I was a good colleague, this is why people would want to work with me again, and then I have them do that as a narrative about their colleagues, you know, and tell, tell me what's up. And usually, usually it goes well. There'll be stuff about, you know, about the tough colleague. I also incorporate, and I'm very transparent about this, that their colleague rating will also be what we, the viewers, saw as their interaction and mutual respect during the presentation, you know, in their professionalism. So if I see people who had a pretty good working relationship, but ultimately they somebody was dominating <laughs> the, the presentation or the keynote or something, or, or they were at odds, I'll you know remember that. How do you manage that there's conflicting views between the group members? So one person would say this person was great, another says they were terrible to work with. Do you check back in with them, or how do you? It's only happened once out of having a couple of hundred people do this at this point. I've had it happen that someone, you've all had that student who's more blessed with confidence than um, contributions. Um, so I've had it happen a couple of times that someone was really astonished that people weren't like 
dazzled that she had gone in and edited things like the night before without telling them and made it so yeah. much better. Just had that last semester. You know, and, and so I'm starting to get good at it. I'm starting to get much better at giving advice to avoid those things. Mm -hmm. Like you might think you're improving something, but in a group we get permission, you know? Um, I've only had it happen once that one group member thought someone else was really problematic and the other people didn't. And I ended up very gently asking each group member, like, can you tell me a little more about your process? Can you tell me a little bit more about what's going on? Um, and ultimately, I think two people had sort of a really bad communication style and I ended up um, being like, okay. But, um, but it really is uncommon. I think when you tell people, like, your peers are going to tell Professor Smith what it was like to work with you, and then Professor Smith is going to grade you on that. It changes things. <laughs> and then grade-wise, for those students who have extenuating circumstances, how do you deal with that once you find out? Um, I ultimately, um, there has, it has not come to pass that anyone ended up not participating at all in offering something, but I've, I've come up with accommodations for the students, the other students in the group, if they need a little extra legwork for me. And um, for students who, for instance, couldn't attend the presentation or something, I, I really, it's, you can treat it like an ASAC accommodation um, or a dean of students accommodation. And that's, you know, we've had real talk. I mean, I think it's, it's very teaching intensive to do this stuff with people. Um, but I've had a real talk with, actually already this semester, um, someone about the line between, um, you know, accommodated absences and sort of pre-opting out of interacting um, with people. It, I think it, I mean, I, I really think it ends up working out well if you can communicate to people that it's fair because it's based on objective standards. And I think having tons of objective standards overlaid um, both in one, they're going to be rating each other themselves on. Um, and that they're supposed to be holding themselves to the same standards. I've actually never had anybody lie about showing up and doing the work that they actually hadn't shown up and done, and I think it's because they know the other three people are going to be honest. Do you think that the, the kind of assessment, peer assessment you're making, <clears throat> you're, the way you phrased it, when they know in advance that the peers are going to comment on them, and that's a big part of the grade, that seems to me to mirror what happens in life and jobs. And that every, you know, you have a certain way of behaving and people in the organization are going to care about, not just your immediate boss. And I wonder if you feel that this also prepares them for, you know, adult work type situations. Or so again, and I think, you know, AUS, especially SPA, I think is kind of, um, it's, it's, it's unusual in that so many of us aren't academics. I don't do, you know, scholarship. Um, I, I went to trade school, I'm a lawyer, like I do jobs at places that, you know, um, other places. And so it, there's a part of my mindset that's very much of that as opposed to of academia. And what I tell them is, is if you want me to write you a rec letter for something or you want me to give you advice about or pick up the phone and say, you know, I think this person should have an internship or fellowship or opportunity, you know, they're not asking me if you're a great writer because even like the best honors student on graduation day isn't as sort of as good of a writer as the executive director's assistant is. <laughs> you know, at that point, um, they're asking like, will I sleep well at night knowing that there's a hearing tomorrow and Penelope is the person that's kind of getting everything set up? Like that is actually the question they're asking. What are you like to work with? Will they? be reasonably okay if everything goes to hell and you all are working at 10, 11 at night, one night fixing something and you are the person who's there fixing it with them. Um, that's the question that, they're, that, that I'm answering when I write a rec letter. And so this is the best way I know to answer that question. And it's why it matters more than you know certain things about your writing or your dialect. Um, and, and, and I do try and model, I'm just trying to see if you're a good colleague. So how do you take that and turn it into a grade or points for the students? 
And do you have a proportion that these grades contribute to the overall student grades? Do you have some rules that you Yeah, so the Blackboard rubric, if you look, um, this particular one, um, this is for a group project. Yeah, not for the moot court. For the moot court, it's like, you know, 20% of, of moot court, which is 50% of your grade. So I, I'm, yeah, they said to be on that. Um, 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 for this particular rubric that I need, um, the collaborative component, the colleague grading, is 20% of the grade for that project. And I think that that particular project was like 30% of the course grade or 35%. So you could be like a crud colleague and still pull a B out in the class. Um, you know, loses you the rec letter and, and, you know, the broad, you know, reference and stuff for me, but, um, I, I think, you know, our, our students often care enough about um, their grades that even if it works out that your colleague component um, and that interactive part of your class participation component together still are only like 10, 15 percent of your grade, I think they still take it seriously. And what I'm really trying to do, even though it's not a hugely immensely high impact point-wise component, is I try to keep indicating throughout the semester that this is what we're about. Um, we are about becoming, you know, good colleagues and a good learning community. And I don't think it's just lip service. I mean, I did go to a hippie college and major in English, but I, I use the word learning community all the time. And a lot of the time, I'll refer to them as each other's colleagues or our colleagues, like as we're talking. And I'll be like, Matthew, your colleague said that the court, you know, wouldn't have done it that way. And um, what do you think that? Or and I'll try and switch to language like our or or sometimes, you know, our challenge here. And hopefully they feel, you know, they're getting the message that I'm thinking of us all as a part of something. And I think as well giving compliments to them, I should have said that I often like really try to point out to students in front of other students, like that was fantastic, thank you for that. And they look with on um, that student with some kind of esteem and want to you know, work with that person. What do you think of, or how would you go about assessing more impromptu group discussions that might need to be presentations? Or how would end up being like, this, like, these are, I think I'm going to get on the visa that you know, it's a little bit more planned out, but, uh, but I think I'm trying to, I'm trying to move myself more towards, but in the meantime, I'm going to have to come slowly, is that I've been trying to do large group discussions, which isn't getting much, so I want to change it into small group discussions, but then how should I buy them? Oh, you know, do you have your own stage, or does anyone have to do that? Well, what I try to do is, one is that I, I tell them in advance that I'm, I'm going to be asking you at the end of the semester to how you measure up against your goal for how you engage in those. Is it listening better? Is it hearing criticism? Is it talking more? And uh, keep that in mind and tell them, ask them how you think you're doing. You can do a mid-semester self-evaluation on that. And then as well, what I like to do is if people turn and, you know, are turning and talking, I, I say, okay, you know, Joe's group. Um, what did you get? And sometimes if I notice that, you know, it's always going to be Joe if I say Joe's group, I'll actually pick a person from within that group um, and say, report back, you know, what is your, what is your team, um, what is your, your group thing? So kind of just meeting, like you said, using the credit method, just meeting who to talk and once you bring it back up into the larger group. The other thing I say is that sometimes, um, I got this from my colleague Andrea Brenner, who left here, she'll sometimes give a note card um, at, at the end of the class that's like, hey, you know, Joe, that was fantastic. Um, just want you to know. And, um, or even say, um, you know, tap person after class, and like, I think you should bring that up to the large group next time. And it's, it's actually, um, they will. Another thing is, is um, not in the two classes that I showed assessments for, but I've had reading journals for one of my classes. And they're pass fail, but it's to it's to get accountability for reading. But if I have them done enough in advance, I'll actually skim them. And sometimes I'll send a note, be like, um, you know, Penelope, I, I hope you actually raise your hand and say this very same point in class. And sometimes actually if I do teach with slides, which I've occasionally done, I will use them to put the first slide on the board. You know, Sophia says, 
and a quote from Sophia's reading journal. And uh, that's the class discussion. And I usually pick someone who's, who's ordinarily not a big hand raiser. So I just said this sort of tricky thing happened, and I don't, I would love some feedback. I do a early course check in in order to make changes during the semester. And one of the things that came back was more time to talk about current events, but not just politics, because we're in the school of communication. So I said, okay, so what, let's, what do you want to talk about? And if they want to talk about the Grammys, someone suggested the Grammys, they'll jump in the Grammys. And wow, I learned a lot, so that was good for me. They seem to enjoy it, and there's definitely stuff that's happening. We try to guide it through a communications lens. But I started to, on one hand, it's very good. It's the, it's the group of the class saying, we want to do this. So that's very good. And I'm trying to think, how much should I continually do that? And I'm okay with doing it. It just it caught me a little off guard, because in a sense, they're running the class. That's it. You won. You won. You were the best teacher. You <laughs> <laughs> That's the dream. I held a couple of wild card dates into some of my syllabi, and I asked the students to suggest a topic that should be there that's in keeping with the theme of the class. And another thing I do is I offer as a kind of a possibility for class, particip for class participation grade is you be the professor, which is you pitch me a um, topic and suggest readings and we'll we'll cue it up a little bit in advance, but you know, we'll plan out the um, the 15, 20 minutes or something that that student teaches. And not that many people have taken me up on it, but they've been really good. Someone taught uh, in my online political system all about Puerto Rico, which is a thing I knew nothing about in the place he was from, and the class loved it. And then another came up with this really abstruse civil justice question that I absolutely loved, and it was amazing. So it is uh, now 2.10, or very close to, which is the end of this session. Now, I just want to say that uh, thank you, first of all, to Laura for leading this Chalk Talk. All of the resources, the slides, will be uploaded to the Chalk Talk website on the CTRL webpage, so you should have access to that uh, over the next few days if you want to look at some of these things, that uh, the slides and Blackboard snapshots.